Hello, I'm Dr. Tawna Pittman. I work for Engender Equality, which is a Tasmanian statewide family violence service. These videos are supported by the Crown through the Department of Communities Tasmania. Welcome to video five of the Coercive Control series. There's 10 in this series. Today, I focus on the styles of coercive control. Next week, I explain the effects of coercive control, which are material as well as emotional and traumatizing. So stay tuned for the styles of coercive control. back again. I have a PowerPoint to take you through on the styles of coercive control. So if we have a think about how many different ways there are to oppress another country, another person, another group, um, there's also many ways to oppress someone in an intimate relationship. There's many attitudinal styles and behavioral styles that we have discovered. Today, I'm going to talk to you about 10 of them that have been developed by a practitioner called Lundy Bancroft. But before I start, I just want to go show you the overall coercive control series. We've been through the introduction, the dynamics part one and part two, and the tactics. This week is the styles of coercive control. Next week is the effects. The week after is the stages, and then the children, the post-separation consequences and challenges, and then transformation, healing, and recovery. But today's presentation will be uh, on the styles and first of all I'll be re revisiting the first four episodes very briefly, very briefly talking about the colonizing attitudes and behaviors that are inherent to coercive control, discuss with you Lundy Bancroft and who he is, the 10 styles of coercive control that he has outlined and then a summary. So First of all, revisiting what we've covered so far, it's really important to remember that coercive control is a very patterned misuse and abuse of power in an intimate relationship. The attitudinal style of the coercive controller will bring about boundary and rights violations that will be detectable in every area of the relationship. A focus on the incidents and injuries conceals the attitudinal style and the different behavioral styles that are indicative of coercive control. And that was commonly what used to happen and still does happen all around the world, a focus on the incidents and injuries. And according to Stark, the terms family and domestic and violence can be very misleading and problematical as the attitudinal and behavioral style is neither primarily about family or domestic or violence. Of course, it is more about control and coercion. Mile and Hole in their article, The Golden Thread, Coercive Control and Risk Assessment for Domestic Violence in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence, they talk about the fact that coercive control is the golden thread running through risk identification and assessment for domestic violence. And that risk assessment tools structured around coercive control can help police officers move beyond an incident by incident response and towards identifying the dangerous patterns of behavior that precede domestic homicide and may not end in domestic homicide, but definitely precede it. So there's a picture of the golden thread. And what I'm trying to convey to you in, these, in this series on coercive control is that it is like a web. It's like a spider's web. That thread can be turned into a spider's web, which has an attitudinal and a behavioral style. It's a web of dynamics and it's a web of tactics. 
So I'm just going to go through the um, web of dynamics with you um, again. Starting at the beginning, we've got the superior, entitled, and attitudinal adversarial style. That's the spider at the center of the web. It's the creator, the builder of the web, and it bleeds out through the entire relationship. It infects every part of it. And in the conversational patterns, you'll experience verbal abuse and emotional abuse and be silenced overall. In the social arrangements, you'll experience social abuse and be isolated overall. In the financial arrangements, financial abuse and overall, you will be exploited. In the sexual relationship, you'll experience sexual abuse and overall, you'll be subjugated. And how you're talked about to others you will experience defamation abuse, and if they, if that is successful, you will experience alienation. And in the physical relationship, you'll experience physical abuse, and overall, you will be threatened. So silenced, isolated, exploited, subjugated, alienated, and threatened is no way for anybody to live. And that is what happens in coercive control because of the attitudinal style and the dynamics getting played out in every area of the relationship. As I've explained before, depending upon the style of the coercive controller, some areas of the relationship are less targeted than others. There are some coercive controllers who are very, very controlling of your every move, and there are some coercive controllers who are not so worried about controlling your every move but expect to be catered to and to have their demands met at all times or there will be retaliation. So colonizing attitudes and behaviors. If we again go into the center of the web, superior, entitled and adversarial attitudinal style, they are really colonizing attitudes. They are the same attitudes with which one country colonizes another, takes over their culture, creates dispossession and a loss of identity and um, an annihilation of their, their way of life and their self-esteem and their safety. So colonizing attitudes are at the core of coercive control and they bleed out through the entire relationship. There are colonizing behaviors that come about because of the colonizing attitudes that get played out in each area of the relationship, ending up with severe consequences. Again, silenced, isolated, exploited, subjugated, alienated, and threatened. The, the consequences of colonizing somebody are serious. And whether or not the colonizer or the coercive controller is interested in controlling every aspect of your life or parts of it, the consequence will still be felt in every area of the relationship because of the dynamics, because of the way that the attitudinal style plays out, because it's not possible for there to be a central attitudinal style that does not touch some part of the relationship. No part of the relationship can be quarantined from that. Now, a common concern that I often hear is this that a coercive controller is actually a three-dimensional human being and, and I'm describing a very flat one-dimensional process in a way. But what I'm trying to do to you for you <laughs> is to describe a pattern of behavior or course of conduct. Now, a coercive controller is a three-dimensional human being as well as engaging in coercive control and their humanity is an important part of the equation, but not at the expense of attending to and addressing their patterned use of an attitudinal and behavioral style that takes away the humanity of another person. We all have a duty of care to detect and prevent this course of conduct and pattern of relating. 
If every coercive controller was charged, our legal system would be completely overwhelmed. It is that common. So who is Lundy Bancroft um, who has developed these 10 styles that I'm going to be going into shortly? He uh, wrote the book, Why Does He Do That? Inside the Minds of Angry and Controlling Men in 2002. This book has been really prominent in the family violence literature. Lundy Bancroft used to work, he's written many books, um, The Batterer as Parent, Why Does He Do That? When Dad Hurts Mum, Daily Wisdom and Should I Stay or Should I Go? He's worked with over a thousand abusers directly as an intervention counsellor and has served as a clinical supervisor on another thousand cases. He's also served extensively as a custody evaluator, child abuse investigator and expert witness in domestic violence and child abuse cases. Lundy appears across the United States as a presenter for judges and other court personnel, child protection workers, therapists, law enforcement officials and other audiences. And on the right there is a list of topics that he commonly speaks on all around the world. So Lundy Bancroft has really worked with an awful lot of men and, has, and ca has come to a very clear understanding of the mentality of the batterer, as he calls them, and, and, how, and how they actually operate. And coming up is a video clip of Lundy Bancroft where he describes the mentality and the things that he's noticed in their work in his work with batterers. Take a listen to Lundy. Except the fact that my clients were pretty aware of what they were doing. A, a great moment, and I, I worked for Emerge in Cambridge. I wasn't one of the founders, but I got there a few years after it started, but I was at Emerge for many years, which was the first program, specialized program for men who batter in the country. A great moment while I worked there, but it didn't involve me. David Adams and Carol Souza, who both worked there, they led a batter group together. And Carol Souza was really one of my biggest influences. David Adams also huge in what I've learned from him. And from Susan K. Wett and various others, Ted German and various others that emerged. Uh, David and Carol had prepared a skit for a training that they were going to be doing on domestic violence, where David was playing the batterer and Carol was playing the battered woman. And they decided that they would rehearse it in front of the group that they led for men who batter. They were curious to see how their clients would react to this and whether the clients would feel it was realistic or not. And so they acted it out for their group. And the group's reaction was very interesting. The group's reaction was to get quite uh, energized and agitated by this skit and be very bothered by things that David was doing wrong and start telling him how he should be doing it. And they were telling him things like, well, you can't let her talk like that because once she gets going, you'll never shut her off. You gotta cut her off right away as soon as she starts. <laughs> and they would say, you gotta move closer to her so that she knows that you mean business. Move over more where she is. And in other words, in the excitement of giving feedback on this skit, they were forgetting to play their normal, their normal role of out of control, I don't know why I do it, I don't know what comes over me, abuser. So as I started to put these pieces together and finally started to believe the people around me and what they've been telling me for a while, my mentors that emerged, I started to ask my clients why they had not done even more serious things. Okay, you're telling me that you lost control of yourself because they always say they lost control of themselves. You say that you, you slapped her twice and then you shoved her and she fell onto the floor. Okay, there she was on the floor, right? It would have been easy to kick her in the head. Why didn't you kick her in the head? He can always tell me why. He doesn't say the way someone who was truly out of control would say, gee, I don't know, I just stopped or I just didn't. He'll say, oh, I didn't want to hurt her that badly. If I did that, I could kill her. Uh, I suddenly realized one of our children was watching. 
these are all sort of real life things the clients have told me. Uh, she was screaming really loud and the police, have, the neighbors have called the police on us before. It's never on me, it's on us. The, 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 the neighbors have called the police on us before and I was afraid they'd call again. And the most common response I get, more common than all the others put together, when I, when I lay out those scenarios of why you didn't do even the next, the next thing up the line, oh, I wouldn't do that. And that's a very revealing response because it tells you, A, that he's not out of control, that he doesn't do things that to his own moral system are beyond the pale. Uh, and it tells you that his fundamental problem is in his beliefs about what is acceptable because he believes as long as he doesn't cross that line, it's okay. If he's the kind of guy who, who tells his wife periodically that he's going to kill her and he locks her in rooms and he raises his fist to her, but he never actually punches or slaps her, then the real batterer is the one that punches or slaps her. If he's the one that punches or slaps her, then the real batterer is the one that strangles her. If he strangles her, then the real batterer in his mind is the one that puts a gun to her throat, to her head and says he's going to kill her and who rapes her. And Then if he does those things, then the real batterer is the one who killed her. It's always this other... Oh, one more I got to tell you. Dozens and dozens of, of clients have said to me, you know, I'm not one of those guys who comes home and beats his wife for no reason. Again, very revealing of the batterer mentality. The real batterer is the guy that does it for no reason. Well, I've never known the guy that does it for no reason. He doesn't exist. Every batterer develops this system for justifying what he does. What's in it for him? Why batter? First of all, he gets his way. And I don't want you to get the impression that battered women don't stand up for themselves. This is one of the complete misconceptions about battered women. They do stand up for themselves. But it gets harder and harder as the years go by. And they start picking their battles more and more. They stand up for themselves less often. They stand up for themselves less forcefully, except for periodic times when they just decide to let out all stops. But they pay a huge price every time they they go for it, standing up for themselves or standing up for their children. And so he gets more and more cooperation and compliance over time because he's dangerous. He's at the very least severely psychologically dangerous, and he's at least to some extent physically dangerous. I should say, by the way, that over 50 percent, not not 80 percent, not 90 percent, but over a little better than half, of battered women do some kind of, I don't know what, what image you think of as beating up, but do some kind of physical or sexual assault on her every month. There are other batters who they let it boil, they make you feel like maybe it's going to come, you never quite know when it's going to come, but the actual physical or sexual assault happens every two years. And that can be enough to keep everybody in the face, as long as it comes out once in a while, or he knows how to get you to feel like it's just about to come, that's enough to keep everybody in the family really frightened. And walking on eggshells. So he gets a lot of cooperation. He gets his way. Uh, he gets economic benefits. He gets to orient the family's resources towards what matters to him. He's often ripping the woman off economically in all kinds of ways. Taking money from her, getting her inheritance from her, running her into debts, borrowing money from her that he never pays back, and so on and so forth. Uh, destroying her earning ability often in various ways, and I would sabotage the development of her education or her career. Uh, at divorce time, the, 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 the effects of this often become particularly pronounced because the whole way that he's laid the groundwork can leave her in a situation where he's got everything and she's got nothing. And this we hap happens particularly commonly in a domestic violence divorce. So there's economic benefits to him. Uh, he gets a lot of service on his terms, get waited on, get his meals cooked for him, get, get, get the shopping done for him, his children raised for him, all this work. And he can give back as much or as little as he chooses. It's entirely on his terms. And he's going to tend to get her working very, very hard. Women and children in homes where there's a batterer work extra hard generally to please the batterer. You have to. You have to. If you don't, you will pay for it. So he gets catering. 
uh, he gets to impose a lot of double standards. So he can be very flirtatious with other women or even be sleeping with other women, but punish her terribly for any, even having a male friend. He, over time, tends to start punishing her terribly even for having female friends. He tends to isolate her socially increasingly over time. Uh, he gets to criticize her relentlessly, but he gets to be above criticism himself. Very hard. You can criticize the batter to some extent some days, but he's never going to do anything about it, even, if, even the days that he does let you do it. Other days he's going to cream you for cr trying to criticize him. Uh, I noticed how my clients seem to constantly be talking about how their wives or girlfriends nag them. Oh, she nags me this, she nags me about this, she nags me about that. And I figured out, it took me a while, it took me a long time actually, but I finally figured out what this means. Nag means presses me to meet my responsibilities. And that is Lundy Bancroft with great words of wisdom. And now into the 10 styles of coercive control that have been constructed by Lundy through his decades of working with um, men who use coercive control and the um, agendas for each of these styles can be made into uh, for being workable for any gender, for any gender of somebody who is perpetrating coercive control. The first one is Mr. Right. The agenda is I'm always right. I'm the ultimate authority. My partner is in danger of their own idiocy. A main double standard is that with my intelligence and intellectual superiority, I can't take you seriously. Look up to me, accept my way, and your life will go far better. A double bind that I have is if you disagree with me, your thinking is sloppy and you are mistreating me. Now, of course, there'll be many more double standards and double binds. There'll be a whole web of them that Mr. Wright uh, uses in his web, in his web of dynamics and his web of tactics. But that, that double standard and that double bind is just used to give you an idea of, of, of the agenda. I say I have strong opinions and like to debate, but really I just like to impose and bully. I know better than you what is good for you. I may ruin plans, leave a place without you or defame you to others in front of you. I can be physically violent. I use a tone of authority and I know every one of your faults, which I may parade in front of others. I like you to doubt yourself. You will regret insisting on having your own mind. You will also start to doubt how smart you are and your mental abilities as that is what I want. The second one is Mr. Sensitive and the agenda is I'm super sensitive and very easily wounded. I love the language of feelings and seem like a new age man, but I just use jargon and psychobabble to control you. The double standard I like to have is that if you hurt me, I will go on and on about it. But if you tell me that I have hurt you, I will brush it aside and use pop psychology to tell you to let it go and that no one can hurt you unless you let them. The double bind I run is that I psychologically assault you and then I analyze your response for what's wrong with you which can actually have a really negative effect on you and be very confusing and debilitating. I come across as soft-spoken, gentle and supportive, but I'm not. I use a lot of blame and keep you heavily guilted. I am mean to you away from the public eye. I speak of my aggression towards you as anger and that you have angered me. My anger, though, is unfair anger, but I know it bothers you to anger me. I cry a lot, but it's self-centered and I know it gets me emotionally catered to. You should be grateful for me for being with a sensitive person like me. So that's Mr. Sensitive. Rambo, Rambo's agenda is I'm aggressive with you and everyone. I am initially a gallant or a white knight, but only at the beginning because I lack respect and have violent tendencies. 
a double standard I have is that you are here to serve me. I'm not here to serve you. The double bind I run is that women should be protected, but it's also important to keep our women in line. Strength and aggressiveness are good, but compassion and conflict resolution are bad. I get a thrill out of intimidating. I often have a criminal record for violence, theft, drug, drink driving or drugs. Femininity and femaleness are inferior. Women are here to serve men. I will make you feel protected at the beginning. I look for women who seem to need protecting. So Rambo is someone to be aware of when you are dating. The water torturer agenda, number four. Now this is a style that is very commonly seen in family violence services because it doesn't necessarily involve any um, physical violence. It may do, um, and it may do particularly around separation, but it may never include physical violence. I stay even, calm, self-assured and have a superior, contemptuous, smug style that I use when I flounce you in conversations and make you react. A double standard I have is it is my right to decide what is abusive and what isn't. The double bind I run is that I use tactics to destroy your calm and equilibrium and then I call you crazy. I'm expert at assaulting you emotionally and psychologically. I know just how to do it. You will yell in frustration, leave the room crying or sink into silence. And then I can tell you and everyone else that you are impossible to deal with. You won't be able to describe my behavior very well to others, but I will say you are unstable, mentally unwell, ill or disordered, etc. I know exactly how to get under your skin. I cause enormous psychological damage to you as my tactics accumulate over time. Number five, the victim agenda. I appeal to your compassion to make a difference in my life without telling you the truth of my behaviour. Life has been unfair and hard and I have been chronically underestimated. So I will enlist you as a co-conspirator against whoever I think has wronged me. Now that's currently an ex-partner. That's commonly an ex-partner. The double standard I have is everything revolves around my wounds and my feelings, not yours. The double bind I run is if you stand up to me or challenge me in my thinking, you are abusing me like everyone else. I will tell you that you don't understand or appreciate me, but actually it's the other way around. I've had it so hard, I am not responsible for my actions. So don't you dare add to my pain by challenging me or leaving me. I will present myself in court as a victim of you and that you are trying to keep the children from me. I am blameless and I like to invert reality. And I'll, that means I'll blame you for what I am doing. Now, the victim agenda may not include physical violence, but there are times when it might. It's not as commonly experienced in this agenda. The terrorist agenda may well include physical violence. I get a thrill from being highly controlling, extremely demanding, threatening and frightening. I can be physically violent. I'd li I like to see you cowering and debilitated. I may not be violent, but I do like to terrorise you with threats and bizarre behaviour. For example, I may tell you of friends of mine who uh, like to kill and will kill for other people and get paid for it. I may cut out a picture of uh, a woman who was killed by her husband and leave it on the table. Little things like that, just to keep you threatened and terrorized. A double standard I run is you have no right to defy or leave me. A double bind I run is I keep you terrorized or scared to prevent you from affecting others because I like to tell you how bad you are. I aim to paralyze you with fear to prevent you from leaving me or having an affair. You need to seek confidential help as soon as possible because you can't think when people like me keep you so traumatized. I may stalk, threaten and harass you if you leave. I will try to control you through the children. 
I would rather die than accept your independence. I believe women are evil and need to be kept terrorized for their own good and the good of others. Now, remember, this can be um, relevant for any agenda, for any gender. But Lundy Bancroft first came across this style from working with men. Number seven, the demand man. The agenda is, I insist that you cater to me and meet my needs. I will be enraged if I'm inconvenienced or if I don't think you are catering to me. I take entitlement to the extreme. A double standard I have is that my needs come first, not yours. A double bind I have is that you should be tremendously grateful to me for occasionally almost meeting my most basic responsibilities to you and our relationship. It is impossible to make me happy and I criticise you endlessly. I expect far more catering than what I give to you. I make you feel like you owe me. I work hard to keep my public image and to convince others how selfish and ungrateful you are. I'm loving to you in order really just to prove to myself that I'm a good person. If you meet all my needs, I show less interest in controlling other parts of the relationship. I am very loving and you are very lucky to have me. Any problem is your fault. That's another common profile that we see in our, in our family violence service is a demand man who whereas he may not control every part of the relationship like some of the other styles will, you have to meet every one of their needs and on time and in their way in order to survive the relationship. Number eight, the drill sergeant. The agenda is I control your life in every aspect. I take control to the extreme. I can be physically violent. Now, this uh, style of coercive control is one that is particularly dangerous and where every part of the web, if you like, will be completely and utterly controlled by the drill sergeant. I will tell you what you can wear, do, say, eat, how often and in what way we will have sex, whether and when you can sleep, who you can talk to and how long you have to get back from work. I monitor your every daily move and depending on how skillful I am at technology, I will track and monitor you from anywhere. A double standard I have is I insist that you do it my way. Double bind that I have, I love you more than anyone, but you disgust me. I am crass, sexually degrading, hypercritical and dangerous. I will inevitably be physically violent. Since I keep you hostage, you will be without support and it will be hard for you to reach out for help, but you need to do so as you are not safe with me. Call a hotline as soon as possible. You shouldn't have anyone else or anything else in your life but me. Only I know how things should be done. It is quite possible I have some mental issues and a terrible childhood, but you still need to get help and get safe as soon as possible. It will be hard for you to do so because I watch you like a hawk and invade your space and privacy constantly. But please find a way to get help with me. Number nine, the player. The agenda, you never know where you stand with me. I play people off. I am alluring and sexually oriented and very into you at first. It thrills me to use people without any regard for them. Women were put on this planet for me to have sex with them. That could just as easily be people were put on this planet for me to have sex with them. The double standard is this relationship should be convenient to me. The double bind is that women who want sex are too loose and those who don't are too uptight. I know how to make you feel special, but I also know how to keep you off balance so that you don't know where you stand with me. I will tell you that the other people that I'm involved with are lying or jealous. It is possible that I will become physically violent towards you for catching me, for che for catching me cheating on you. If you could meet my sexual needs, I wouldn't have to turn to other, other women. And if you want 
the non-sexual parts of you appreciated there is something wrong with you. A player likes to get in between other people and cause drama and confusion and misunderstandings. As long as they're in the middle, they are happy because they get all the attention and everybody revolving around them. Number 10, the mentally ill or addicted abuser. Now, this particular style can be part of any of the other styles. Their agenda may be that I have, um, well, their agenda is I may have a mental health issue, a psychiatric or a substance abuse problem. The majority of abusers do not have a psychiatric or substance abuse problem, but if they do, it is not the cause of their abuse. It will increase the severity of the abuse. A double standard is I am not responsible for my behaviour, you are. One of the double binds are if you challenge me, you will trigger me and you will be responsible for the consequences. I don't generally stick to my medication. I am too selfish to care about the implications for you. If you push me, I will tell you that you are being mean and not understanding. If I have a diagnosis of paranoia, severe depression, delusions or hallucinations, obsessive compulsive disorder and anti-social personality disorder known as psycho psychopathy or sociopathy, it can increase my danger to you. My attitudes towards you will be the same as any other course of control though. If I suffer from narcissistic personality disorder, I have a highly distorted self-image. Uh, I am unable to accept that I might have faults and therefore are unable to imagine how other people perceive me. My condition is highly compatible with abusiveness, but there is only a small percentage of people like me who receive this diagnosis. So a, a coercive controller who uh, has a, a mental health issue, a psychiatric or a substance abuse problem, can really make it uh, very difficult for the victim in that they will expect to have that catered to and expect to have that as being understood as the reason for their behaviour. But uh, as Lundy Bancroft makes very clear, the majority of abusers do not have a psychiatric or substance abuse problem. They, they can act like they actually do, but that is not the cause of their abuse. It just simply increases the severity of it. Now, I'm sure that you have all come across the literature, the extensive literature on narcissism. There are very few people who are actually diagnosed in a society, in any country, with narcissistic personality disorder. Now, the clues to the presence of that disorder include self-centeredness that is severe and it carries over into situations that don't involve their partner their ability to relate everything back to themselves and their outrage whenever criticized and an incapacity to consider that they are anything other than kind and generous this disorder is highly resistant to therapy and is not treatable with any medication the use of narcissism, he's a narcissist, she's a narcissist, they're so narcissistic, can be very, um, it's overused because really it can be it can be overused to the point where anyone that you don't like or you, dis you disagree with or you find hard to get along with, you can describe as a narcissist. However, the literature on um, narcissism is very very interesting when it's not too sensational and a lot of what is discussed is very relevant to coercive control but we do need to be careful about who we go around calling a narcissist so finally the summary of today's session if you are concerned about how dangerous your partner may be or the partner of someone you know, see, is he going to get violent in Chapter 6 and leaving an abuser safely in Chapter 9 of Lundy Bancroft's book? They are incredibly helpful chapters. 
If you're in Australia, please ring the 24-7 hotline 1800RESPECT, which is 1800 737 732. You can also ring them if you're concerned about somebody else in order to get some help, some advice, and uh, maybe some referrals. Getting back to the styles, to apply the styles to any gender, just go for what the agenda is of that style. There will be a different web of tactics according to each style and different areas of the relationship targeted for control. So in each style, the web of abuse, the web of dynamics will have a different concentration of tactics in some areas than in others. There will be tactics right around the web, but there'll be a concentration of them in some areas than in others. For example, the drill sergeant will have tactics right around every area of the web. They are across everything you do, say, every aspect of your thinking, your life, your behavior. Whereas the victim may not be as interested in controlling other parts of your life as long as you are um, addressing their victim agenda. And the, uh, the player will have a very high concentration of tactics in the sexual area of the relationship as well as around the whole area of the web and the relationship, but particularly around the sexual area. So that there are just some examples of how the different styles will show up in what, which part of the web is affected the most, where the tactics uh, are more constellated. But don't forget, every part of the web will still be affected. A coercive controller can be a mixture of the above styles. Some uh, clients have said to me over the last 15 years that, that their partner is actually, there's a part of every one of those styles within their partner that they can recognise. And other clients have said, no, my partner is definitely a water torturer or my partner is definitely a water torturer and also Mr. Sensitive, which is a very common combination and extremely difficult for people to deal with because there is generally no physical violence, generally, and, uh, and the tactics are low level and relentless and very uh, much based around the conversational style and it can be so uh, confusing for the victim that they do not know how to articulate it whereas a person can quite clearly articulate what a drill sergeant does because uh, it's a it's a really clear style um, and that's that's what makes it so hard for people to talk about what is happening to them when they don't know the different styles that have already been um, isolated. Sometimes they, a uh, coercive controller can be more like one or two of the styles. The styles are just a guide. So Lundy Bancroft insists that there may well be other styles that he has not found yet but after all his work and the work of other people in the organizations that that he's worked in i would say and judging from my experience and the experience of many family violence workers these styles are a really really helpful and accurate guide just remember finally that some coercive controllers are oriented towards different tactics to acquire and maintain control and cooperation and that's the main thing to take away that not every coercive controller works in the same way they might they will have the same framework of dynamics there'll be the same web of dynamics there'll be the tactics will be different for every style of coercive controller we've come to the uh, end of the presentation now but I have some questions for you to ask yourself or uh, to help someone else with if they're a bit concerned as to what's going on in their relationship. 
Ask yourself if the conversations with your partner are empathic towards you and your perspective or adversarial. Are they confusing or clear for you? Are they coercive or civil with you? Are they aiming for a win-win between you or for you to lose out? Are they retaliatory or are they collaborative? Are they respectful or violating of your boundaries and rights? Are they psychologically and emotionally safe or do you have to cater and submit to your partner? Are they connecting or controlling? And when you actually have a think about those questions, then you might decide that you need to talk to somebody about your relationship. So this is the end of the presentation. Now, thank you so much for watching and listening and stay tuned for next Thursday's episode, which is on the effects of coercive control. Um, I look forward to talking with you next week about the effects. It's a really interesting um, facet of coercive control as to how broad the effects are on a mental, emotional, social, financial, sexual level. Every level of a person's life is affected by coercive control. It does depend how long you're with the coercive controller for and what particular style that they use and, and, and how early you can get help and start to sort it out as to what actually happened to you. Please feel free to like or share these videos and to contact us on the details coming up. If you have any questions or concerns or queries, we're only too happy to answer them. And stay well and stay safe. And bye-bye for now.